I've approached this primarily as, as a music composer, so it's good that here in a in school of music. Most of my formal training has been in that domain, undergraduate degree at Oberlin uh, College in electronic and computer music, and masters and doctorates at the University of Washington, all in composition, but that masters and doctorate audiovisual pieces were part of the output. I was basically bringing my money-making, self-feeding work in graphic design together with in the music domain and trying to find a way to, to combine those together. So I'm trying to get a bit of feel today how those came together and combined with coding. So I see myself very much as a, as a generative artist to say that writing computer code is an integral part of my uh, creative process, part of how I try to create my unique uh, signatures to things. And I also try to communicate a little bit here to the, the centrality to me of thinking of working in these time-based arts as um, sculpting in time, to steal the phrase from the great Russian film director Andrei Tarkovsky. In some ways, we're sculpting these materials in time, trying to create a, something, a whole that is greater than the parts, and integrating the audio and sound, and creating a distinctive experience over time. But I thought it'd be fun to start with this quote from uh, Joseph Robakowski, who presented in the 2015 Punta Uriah. So when I, I pulled up all my notes from that to start building this class, I found my notes and I found this, this quote that I wrote down from him. Warning, I'm not sure if it's a direct quote or if I just paraphrased it, but I think he said, I'm interested in energy. Energy does not need any sort of language. Language just restricts energy. Energy as a means of communication does not need this kind of restriction. So that's part of a way of saying, I'm going to be talking about things today that are fairly easy to talk about, like technology, right, and algorithms. Uh, but the things that are probably most deep, of deep importance to us as artists, I think, are the hardest things to talk about. Um, I apologize to the degree to which I uh, don't touch on those things. Um, but I will try to to some degree. But I always say that yeah, what's most important is experience that goes beyond words. And perhaps an aspect of that experience that I'm particularly interested in could be from this quote from Roger Sessions. May we not say that the basic ingredient of music is not so much sound as movement. Movement of a specifically human type that goes to the roots of our being and takes shape in the gestures which embody our deepest and most intimate responses. So these gestures, we'll see, kind of unveil as we go, uh, unveil as we go through this, uh, is an important part of my thinking. So a core aspect of my work, again, is generative art, uh, working with computer procedural methods, um, and related to the idea of complex systems. Again, generative art, we use this as a, another term for art that involves artist coding and manipulating algorithms as part of his or her process. And there are many definitions of generative art, but I think that one will apply uh, for my work today. So an algorithm is a step-by-step -step process for doing something, usually in reference to computer coding. And then the idea of complex systems. A complex system is a system of interacting parts that gives rise to emergent behavior behavior that cannot be predicted based on the parts themselves. It's kind of revolution that comes out of complexity theory that says very simple systems can give rise to complex results and unpredictable results. Uh, this fascinates me a great deal and has for a long time. And of course, part of the characteristic of such systems is that a very small change in the system could result in a disproportionately large effect on the behavior. We take a group of students in a class, allow them to freely mingle around the room, but we're going to ask them to individually pick two other people in the room, A and B, and they will not acknowledge those people, but keep that to themselves. We then ask them to follow rule number one. Always position yourself so that A is between B and you. We can then ask them to follow rule number two. Always position yourself so you are between A and B. When they follow rule number one, people moved around in random pattern and would have continued in this behavior for hours had we not stopped them. In rule number two, the results are significantly different. Within less than a minute, actually seconds, everybody clusters to the middle in what could be described as an unmovable mass. And related to this, I'd like to give the idea of effective 
complexity coming out of information theory. Uh, the idea that the outputs of a, of a system could provide effective complexity to perception, right? To our eyes or to our ears. Both highly ordered and highly disordered systems are simple. Complex systems exhibit a mix of order and disorder. He's trying to define the idea of a simple system and a complex system. He's talking about it in terms of perception. So you can have a highly ordered system, a very strict set of rules, or highly disordered, something that's just being generated, say, by you know, random number generators. Um, both of those can actually, in some sense, be simple. Per uh, perceptually, a uh, perceptually complex system is going to give us a mix of this, order and disorder, uh, things that are perhaps beyond our understanding, uh, and things that are clearly cohere for our perception. I'm generally trying to find that idea of, of the mix of order and disorder. Uh, why? I want mysteriously coherent perceptual complexity. I really love that experience of when I've coded something and then I see what it does and it impacts me powerfully, emotionally, and I don't even know why. Right? That's gold. That means something interesting is happening that I don't already understand and, and know about. And that's part of what uh, generative systems allow me to do. Set up these systems. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Be surprised, hopefully in a positive way, even though I throw out lots and lots of material until I find the gold. So yes, this element of surprise can be really essential for, for creativity. So I'm using the generative techniques and these complex systems in order to create that kind of surprise. And hopefully a density and, and complexity of activity that still seems Coherent. So, with that, we can step into talking about the estuary series. So, the work I've done previously, almost over 12 years, had worked on a, a core set of, of technologies, especially in visual, something I called the Brownian Donut Warper. But with the estuary series, I decided I wanted to go in a new, a new direction, explore some new ideas. So, I wanted to develop and uh, create a new abstract animation technique based on the visualization of direct search optimization. And I wanted to look, uh, find new potentials in something I had already developed and been uh, using, called very, I, I created, called Variable Coupled Map Networks, or VCMN. And there's a piece of software available on my website called NodeWeb that embodies that. I wanted to look uh, some other ways of using that as a generative music tool. And then assess the potential for VCMN to help establish a complex but coherent audiovisual counterpoint. So I was starting to explore a little bit more formally this idea of audiovisual counter counterpoint, and then asking how generative systems could help me achieve that. And in particular, I had this intuition of this idea of what I call fluid audiovisual counterpoint. More of an intuition, and over the years I've been gradually shaping that intuition. Intuition is something clearer. So with the estuary series, I wanted to help, help step that forward, get a clearer sense of uh, what this intuition is. And of course, so algorithmic techniques are here, have this interest in it, but at the same time have this critique of algorithmic techniques, trying to get beyond, it seems like, certain limitations, at least in classical techniques. So algorithmic uh, techniques tend to have a very strong bias towards what I call event basis. Especially if we start in the music domain, note events, that wonderful crystal clear objective thing, the piano keyboard is the paradigm, there's middle C, I can press it, I can hold it for 1.5 seconds and release it, right? Computer music tools and uh, algorithmic techniques have very much been built around that, uh, that, that beautiful clarity. But there's a great deal, of course, in 20th century and into 21st century music that goes beyond just the simple note of that. And most of the revolutions in avant-garde music point to things going beyond that, focusing on timbre, focusing on gesture, on energetic flows and transformations of sounds over time. But not many algorithms help us deal with that. And so related to that, the second thing here, enable continuums, wanting to go beyond just that event base and start to deal with energetic shaping in time. How can algorithms help with that? And then fulfillment of trajectories. So again, classical algorithmic techniques themselves are really good for creating 
static textures create something that is basically the same kind of behavior on an ongoing basis. And in classic algorithmic techniques in music, if you create a trajectory, a change that moves somewhere, you're generally superimposing that. Like you might put upper and lower bounds on behavior of random choice of pitch, so that gradually pitch will go upwards, seeming to have a direction, but you superimpose that. So can we integrate event-based thinking and this continuum and gesture-based thinking together? So let's take a look at a variable coupled map networks, Node Web. And this I presented in, in 2015 as well, because it's been with me for a, a long time. Started with the idea of the iterative map in mathematics. So in mathematics, a map is something that takes um, an input and <laughs> transforms it into something else. You know, if you have, have your formula that converts Celsius to Fahrenheit, that's a map. Looking at a particular iterative map here, Lamer's linear congruence formula, which is actually a classic random number generator. So you can see it has three variables that are A, B, and M. And if you optimize those based on the architecture of your computer, this will create a sequence of pseudo-random numbers. In the world, there is no actual such thing as randomness, uh, certainly not in the computer. What we create is the appearance of randomness using uh, clever mathematics. What's interesting to me as a composer, though, is if we de-optimize this, instead of focusing on randomness, it actually ends up being a very interesting pattern generator. So, and the basis of that is feedback. So many of you will know that in the music domain, feedback is an example of complexity arising from simplicity. Right? The electric guitar amplified going to the speaker and the sound from the back of the guitar vibrating the strings. And we get all that fantastic, amazingly expressive uh, work that comes out of um, electric guitar uh, beyond what you might just think of from the simplicity of the system. Same thing applies in mathematics. Feedback can result in very complex results from very simple systems. So what this, if we read this formula, what it says, our x at time t is based on the previous x, x at time minus 1, multiplied by a and b, and then modulo m. Modulo is a feedback, uh, excuse me, it's, it's a wraparound function. Basically says the number won't get any larger than m. If it's larger than m, it'll be wrapped around until it fits inside the range between 0 and m. So you stick a number, x in there, multiply it by a, add b, modulo m, that becomes our new x, we use it, then we feed that x in, do the same thing over again. And so just for example, we could do very simple things like an initial, that first line there, a value that starts at 0.5 and then quickly drops to 0, or something that starts at 0.5 quickly rises to 1, or example C there, uh, a simple nested iterative pattern repeating over and over again. And then with D and E, we start to get something that's more interesting. We call it complex self similarity. We can't predict what's going to happen next, yet overall, the behavior has consistency to it. So on uh, D, we can see these rising lines, and then little falls of 3 and 2, and 3 and 2, and 3 and 2, jump up, 3 or 2, 3 or 2, jump up, 3 or 2. Right. So you can imagine that map to pitch. That's going to be a, a behavior that we could recognize and grasp. And even E has these repeated elements to it that are given um, definitely would make it distinct from D. So composers have been very interested in this kind of approach. But what I started doing as a doctoral student, actually, was imagining taking this even further. I was using it quite a bit for composing. But I came up with this idea. What if we have multiple copies of this formula? Every one of them we'll call a node in a network. And we can start making networks of these things so they influence each other. Um, so for example, one node might control the dynamics of a node, another one pitch, another one duration. But we could also have the output of one node control the A variable in another one, or the output of this node could control B variable there, the one in the middle. We could even have the output then of the middle one go and control the B variables of the first and third nodes, right? So we're starting to create layers of feedback within feedback. And so the intuition for me is that um, behavior should emerge out of this uh, that would be of interest. So for example, this network sounds like this.
quite a bit of interesting behavior coming out of a very, very, very simple system. Uh, then it went beyond that, started looking at ways of also controlling time. That's what the little, uh, the little delta symbol is on the right. It would be an input that can control how long it takes before that particular node spits out a new value. So that's how rhythm can arise out of it. Ultimately, I developed this into a little piece of standalone software called NodeWeb, which has six, six nodes in it, built into it, all sorts of different ways of mapping that to external uh, MIDI, MIDI data, um, available on my site. And over on the right, just a simple matrix for mapping inputs uh, to outputs. So that was the core uh, algorithmic technique primarily being used for the music. Take a quick look at the OptiMilder video filter to switch to the visual side. So mathematical optimization. Right? In general, optimization is finding the best solution to some mathematically expressed problem. And even for those of you who have studied algebra, would have done some simple cases of trying to find um, say the maximum or minimum or a function, or have multiple functions and try to figure out what value uh, can give you the lowest results from all of them. In other words, by solving equations. But as we get more into engineering purposes, and we often find that there, the things we're looking at can't be achieved just by solving equations and moving, moving the numbers around on the, on the page. So one approach to solving those kinds of things is called direct search methods. So instead of just being able to solve it, figure out what's the best numbers to put in our equation, we kind of um, search for it. I like to think of the, of the terrain of the problem. You could if you imagine it's a three-dimensional problem. Here's this terrain with valleys and peaks, and you can imagine just creating some kind of rule basis for some agent to crawl around in that terrain until it finds the highest peak or the lowest, lowest valley. That's perhaps one way metaphorically to explain what's being done. So the Nelder mean method, which I use here, it's actually a very classic, 1965, John Nelder and Roger Mead. So for an n-dimensional problem, uh, meaning you can deal with high-dimensional high problems as well as, as simple ones, ones with many variables um, or few. It says a polytope of size n plus one crawls around in the search space. And there's an example of one at work, thanks to Wikipedia. So you can imagine this is kind of outlining as a three-dimensional terrain, x and y, and then a, a raised point. And then because that's Two variables, we have a triangle is what crawls around in the space until it finally finds the point. So there's just a set of rules it used, and then it finds that point, which may or may not be the, the peak point in the whole formula. Uh, it's, they're never perfect, which is why people spend their entire careers you know, working on these algorithms and trying to improve them. But for me, from an artistic perspective, I was uh, convinced that visualizing the direct search process could generate artistic useful images. So what we could do is take the behavior of that searcher as it, as it iterates, as it crawls around, uh, create compound figures from all of the steps in that crawling around, and then perhaps even frame to frame, we could be changing the terrain itself so that every time the behavior is a little bit different as it's crawling around. And then combine this with the idea that comes out of uh, particle systems and swarm optimization, let's just have a lot of these <laughs> running, running at the same time, uh, crawling over something. And the compounding of all those images should be of interest. Uh, as I've done with uh, some of my earlier work, I've actually created custom FX plugs for Apple Motion. And then basically we're loosing a lot of agents into the system, either in random locations or in a grid. And what they're crawling around on is actually the RGB data of, of an input image. Uh, we can think of it as two dimensions, the X and Y, and then the brightness of the image is what it's hunting on. So a little triangle, are crawling around, trying to find the brightest points in the image. But wherever these triangles touch in the corners, we can grab the colors, and that's what we will use to paint our image with. It's frame-to-frame -frame feedback. Be familiar, easily done for people who work, say, in the processing visual language. But you retain the previous frame when you're rendering and fade it, blur it, and then superimpose the new frame over it. Uh, and then yeah, you can offset that, you can get interesting bloom effects so that the accumulation of that blur frame to frame can gradually spread out uh, and dissipate or glow, grow and glow. 
Uh, but using this really breaks the tools for most video rendering tools. I mean, most video rendering tools, the process, uh, the paradigm is you should be able to jump to any frame, render that frame. But a system like this, you have to start at the beginning and render continuously through because you are feeding back frame to frame to frame to frame to frame. Uh, and this has be become technically an increasing problem working in a tool like Motion. I keep having to use all sorts of weird, uh, weird techniques to overcome the fact that I'm breaking the tool in order to achieve what I want. But let's, let's give an example. As a source image, stable while this melody starts to express itself. So let's process that now with the Optin Elder filter. filter. It's going to start just doing one iteration, so it creates one triangle. And then we start to increase the number of iterations that it goes through, so it starts going further and further physically, searching for the points. We start adding more agents in a row across, building the density of the texture, all time to work with this exponential shift of the source image to the left at uh, the uh, attack point. One iteration. So we're shifting aspects of the of the search there at the end. So even though the um, that gradated circle was staying stationary, just by changing the parameters of the search, it was getting a little bit of change in the texture that's coming out. So basically the idea was cross estuary series to slowly evolve this uh, into more and more functions. So for example, in estuaries two added the ability to, once it had created a search path, it could take that whole path and rotate it around in various ways. And then we start layering multiple instances of the filter. So we can see a foreground or background texture created with that, then a foreground uh, created with that as well. Estuaries 3, not a big leap, just some more transparency and alpha options, more ways of sizing the points. And then Estuaries 4. And now the Nelder Meet agents, instead of just for, um, being able to crawl around on a source image, uh, now make it so that you can crawl around on mathematical functions but then draw uh, colors from the source image. So to give some examples here, estuaries two with the spinning of the search paths. audiovisual counterpoint. There's you know, hundreds of years of pedagogy about ways of learning how to do uh, counterpoint with traditional musical materials. And I was trying to look at how something in that, especially something called species counterpoint, could help us think about audiovisual counterpoint. Um, but part of the point I made is that we would have to go beyond note object thinking, or I would certainly want to, and start thinking about gestures, um, <clears throat> these energetic trajectories in time. So you could start thinking about a counterpoint of gestures, uh, but fluid audio, audiovisual counterpoint would go beyond that, even. Right? We would emphasize the ebb and flow of alignment and non-alignment of tensions between relatively smooth articula articulation points and continuums, rather than discrete objects and instantaneous change. Perhaps this will seem like an oblique reference, but I can refer to Indian classical music as something that starts, starts to point to this, right? So the paradigm for Western music is that keyboard on the piano, very separate notes. Uh, I studied uh, 2001 to 2 in India, Kyle on classical vocal technique, which is a very different kind of thing, right? What's important is not only that we have these clear, uh, clear scale that we're working in, 
perhaps a clear meter, but the way that you move between notes is an extremely important part of the expression. Right? So, uh, right? those slides, movement, many things working together to create these energetic trajectories in time. So how can we start to think about that way? Can we think about these very fluid art, um, continuums, both in image and sound, um, where you articulate something, change something slightly, but it's continuous, and then you can have relationships between different layers of that kind of behavior. And also, from the Indian classical music side, something about the way that Indian vocalists move is very interesting to me. So from Matthew Rahayam's Music in Bodies, says, I have come to see the gestures of Indian singers as a stream of melody parallel to the voice. This disciplined emotion is neither a random flapping about nor a coded restatement of what is being sung. A gesture complements vocal action without duplicating, revealing knowledge about the shape, texture, and motion of melody. Uh, I thought his exploration of this, these kinds of uh, gestures that the vocalists make was an interesting provocation to think about relationships between image, image and sound. So I will leave it at that, come back in a moment, um, and talk a little bit about this term, audio visualization. So this is from Rio Ikishiro, uh, his PhD thesis from Goldsmiths, 2013, live audio visualization using emergent generative systems. In audio visualization, the audio visual relationship arises as a result of independent presentations of the same data in the audio and visual media. They both relate directly to the underlying process. Furthermore, they relate indirectly to each other via their individual relationship to the underlying process. So he was taking things like um, Lorenz systems, which come out of uh, complexity mathematics, and both visualizing them and modifying them at the same time. And his performance, this is live performance technique, is he's manipulating the Lorenz system to create uh, the audio and visual behaviors. And they are integrated in his mind because of their relationship to the underlying system. I'm fascinated by the idea, but very critical about it at the same time. I think it's an extremely difficult thing to do well because image perception and, and audio perception are so different. So generative linking of them uh, always has the risks of being quite shallow in my estimation. And a lot of my work, it's still me as an artist uh, creating the link between the image and sound, not using generative techniques uh, to bring those together because it's such a complex and sensitive artistic issue. But still fascinating, right? Can generative techniques help us here? How and to what degree and depth can music and image cohere if they're arising from a single underlying abstraction, mathematical or otherwise, but that abstraction is neither musical nor visual in its essence, and not perceptually informed. So I described what I was using for node web, like these little mathematical feedback formulas, connect them together, we start to get emergent behavior. But of course, that system has nothing to do with human perception, right? Which is why 80% of what I generate with it, I throw away, because it's not very interesting to my perception. So I'm doing lots of hunting until I find things that are really interesting to my perception. And that problem gets magnified considerably if we're going to try to do audiovisual stuff from a, from a generative root. But it's still fascinating as a potential, right? So what I wanted to do is try to do some automation of image from node web. So again, the same idea. If having these nodes all influencing each other uh, means that they all have an interesting relationship to each other, if I'm using that musically, could we also use some of that node data to generate image at the same time in a way that's useful and creates an interesting audiovisual relationship. Plenty of reasons to think not, <laughs> as I first tried to explain, but still want to explore it. Uh, very difficult though, from NodeWeb, when it creates this data, we record all of that into a MIDI sequencer, including all of the raw node data. Um, that goes into the Max programming language. Max can create an, well, an XML text file in motion XML, then I hand paste that into the motion file and then open the motion file and, uh, and then do lots and lots of hand editing of the result. So I wrote about this uh, in, a, in a paper 
where I said, uh, well, no, actually, a lot of what this generated was not particularly convincing. So I said, the range of artistic possibilities and audiovisual counterpoint remains immense, and perhaps ultimately resistant to a comprehensive, formal explanation or approach. So from that perspective, audiovisualization assisted composition, what I was doing, use node web it, control both image and sound, uh, provides one valuable means for exploring this range and generating creative outcomes. But in this case, sensitive artistic perception remains essential. Because we have to choose what coming out of that is actually worthwhile, or how what is there might need to be changed to become uh, perceptually interesting. We're trying to add, adapt the algorithmically generated materials to achieve the delicate task of balancing unification and independence of materials, the definition of, of counterpoint. So let's take a look at Estuaries 3, part of it that's probably the primary climax for the piece, kind of the shape to culminate energy right to the peak of it, but it's probably one of my uh, most extensive explorations of this fluid counterpoint idea. I used ESCMN to to create an, an original set of relationships and then did lots and lots of editing. So you'll see two thin green horizontal lines and one thick one. Uh, the thick one is going to move, mostly move slowly left to right. Um, every time a chord changes that underlies everything, boom, it tends to go back to the left. Uh, the thin ones are going to jump more rapidly in association with some percussive material. And then the background we have two orange and white membranes. And here, there's much more of a continuity, the fluidity. Instead of jumps of behavior, it's gradually transforming, but with sharp articulation points. And all of that is interacting with the music. And then lots of small textural details change as we go along. So my intent is, you're not going to be able to catch all the details, but I would hope that you sense that multiple aspects of this very tense activity relate and interweave convincingly, and that there are coherent multiple temporal levels, multiple time levels, from the very detail to the next level to the phrase level to multiple phrases coming together, that these are cohering, cohering and linking together in a convincing way. So, again, with Estuaries 4, I was particularly focusing on this, this issue of, of events, the beauty of clarity of clear note events, um, and the expressive power of, of shaping continuums, trying to bring these together. So the way I work with NodeWeba uh, is semi-real time. I generally set up uh, a set of presets in it, each of which has kind of a distinctive behavioral character. I improvise with those, start to get a sense of what it can do, and then I build a structured improvisation uh, and then I do multiple runs of that, capture that data into a digital audio workstation. I'm using a MIDI slider box to change various parameters of the system as we go. Some of the data is going into the Max programming language for doing interactive audiovisual work. Uh, there I'm adding some post-processing rules to the, to the music sometimes. So, but ultimately we capture all this into a, a music, uh, excuse me, a MIDI sequence here. So, Really strong characteristic here are these descending, uh, excuse me, descending curve gestures. And we can have multiple ones. So let's just take a little look at the orchestration of this. So we have six node web and nodes. This gives us six main instrumental lines. Each of those lines I express with an orchestral sample, plus various kinds of doublings and post-processing to try to get something that is has acoustic character but still feels like it's from a different world. 
Um, and then the sounds, each uh, line is fed through a convolution with a plucked temporis string. So convolution is an audio processing technique. You can think of it as basically superimposing one sound with another. It's commonly used for extremely high quality reverbs. So we could take what's called an impulse of this room and record that and then convolve that with music we have in the digital audio workstation and it would make that sound like it was in this room. But what if we do things unusual, like take a plucked tempura string, string from Indian music, and run sound through that? It's kind of like the, the tempura becomes a filter. And any place the input aligns with the harmonics of the tempura will get amplified. And where they don't align, they will get diminished. Uh, and then I sometimes add additional instrument doubling, because the convolution kind of smears detail. We could add another instrument on top to regain some clarity. So why? I want this hybrid acoustic electronic character. <laughs> Even though I've been tra trained in radical electroacoustic music, I still have a deep, deep love of the classical tradition uh, and the clarity of uh, character of the acoustic instruments. Um, I'm trying to work to create a very rich stereo field uh, and a slightly dissonant edge of the beating tempura. So each, if each of the lines goes through a tempura that's at a different pitch. One line be, might be going through a tempura that's at C. The next one might be going through one that's at C sharp. And so those overtones are going to kind of speed with each other a little bit, just a little edge of dissonance. Uh, and then we get this, we get the sense of wash, and then we have some clarity on top. So let's give an example, just uh, starting with a single note, section A, phrase one, pizzicato violin, doubling that with mountain dulcimer or plucked harmonics. Then when we combine those two, we get. And then send it through the uh, tampura. So now we'll hear this drone um, shadow echo, if you will. Notice the attack has been smeared out a little bit. So I could double that potentially with a uh, celeste. And the result is that. So we've got the acoustic character, but we've also got a sense of another world. But let's give another example with multiple notes. Uh, second line, working with Glockenspiel. Uh, taking a bazooki sample, cutting off the attack. Uh, and then we put those together. So we have Glockenspiel, but slightly um, unusually sharp attack. Now we run it through the tempura. Um, and then doubling that with the piano sound. Let's take just phrase one of the very sec opening section. The combined of all the different MIDI lines and uh, all the kind of processing. Then I'm also feeding that through something called compressed feedback synthesis that I developed that basically is getting feedback loops with pitch shifters, it creates this nice spectrum saturating approach. So if we feed that sound through CFS, we get this. And then we put that all together. So we're still in the, the domain of, of clear note events, but it's starting to get smeared out just through this processing that we're doing. So let's take this Chakuhachi sample, including its breath, I say. Uh, processing this with computer language super collider, an effect called Warp One, which I because it's my mentor who created it. It's important to put his, his name up there, Richard Carpen. Uh, so we'll take a six second sample. We'll use the warp effect to stretch it to 12 seconds and three copies. So one at the original pitch, one an octave higher, and one an octave lower. Uh, slightly different window sizes for the left and right channels, because it's a window and it takes little windows out of the sound and then constructs a new sound out of those windows. Give those slightly different sizes that will open up the stereo image more. So here's the original.
So this is working on the gestural logic, right? For me, if I trace the energy that in time, it's Right. So let's integrate that into the texture, no base texture. So that's the opening, the opening phrase of, of the piece. Worked to provide lots of spaces in what I was improvising in NodeWeb in order to start to fill that in with this more gestural kind of, of material and create a glue that holds everything together. Yeah, we'll do one more, a little bit. Uh, section B now, it's in the contrasting material. Basically, in this piece, I'm very much contrasting this kind of intensity, almost chaotic texture like we heard here, uh, with a much more slow and lyrical uh, kind of material. So, doubling that with a, a resonator model. Which is subtle, but just adds a bit of a glistening to it that again shifts it to a slightly different world, add compressants, uh, feedback synthesis, and other layers. So, on the curved side, what I'm here is working with the Turkish Ney, and again, really capturing the breath with that. Uh, processed within the digital audio work session. So we time stretch this, shift up many octaves so it no longer sounds like an A, then repitching individual notes in order to work with that, uh, the, the texture that came out of VCMN. So let's take the original example from Mr. Elgunen. Which becomes... Which actually, the, the little... Um, Malfunction in the pitch shifting at the end is fantastic. Uh, just truly really wonderful thing to work with. And then finally, I actually worked with a, a, flute, a professional flute friend of mine, Jen George, had her record a whole bunch of uh, flute samples, kind of working in a shakuhachi type of uh, uh, type of effect. And again, trying to get a fairly breathy result, and then we can process that. which create very organ-like effects. Classic way to create an organ sound, layer up lots of flutes and different, uh, <laughs> different octave relationships. And plus special effects like really hard breath effects and so on become useful punctuation elements. And let's just put some of that together here. So for these uh, chaotic materials, uh, get background. It was interesting to look at the background that I'm feeding into the algorithm. Actually, from the Oslo Bergen train run, having a camera stuck out the uh, out the window as we go through the various um, wooded, slatted snow shields that go over the uh, over the railway, turned on its side. So if we run that through OptiNelder, again, this is just with several thousand agents randomly placed. And then with the uh, trails processing and smoothing that out. And so that becomes the, the core material for the chaotic sections. Uh, and we can hear that with music and the starting gesture. So for the contrasting material, this is why I start using the ability to crawl around mathematical functions. In particular, for this piece, I use 
called the Rosenbrock function, or uh, perhaps more friendly, the banana function. It's a function that is difficult to optimize in some ways, so often used for testing. So we can see how it shows up here. Uh, this is the background I use. I let the, this video move while we have the, uh, the melody expressing itself in between. It freezes and then pick up again for the next melody. So start up again. With Optin Elder, the Rosenbrock function. And then we dissolve, shift to a new position like that. So the, this whole section is made up of one position of the Rosenbrock function, holding for a melody, dissolving, shifting around, coming into another position for another melodic phrase, and then with trails. And then let's have that with the music. So this is um, using the ability to kind of, uh, to, to solidify, and solidify with a bit of activity becomes the statement of a melody, dissolving, shifting, becomes the expression of a space between melodies.